One of the reasons that we are all here is that you're great storytellers. And we carry those stories back home with us. Can you please share a couple stories that maybe we haven't heard before <laughs> about Mr. Abel and Mr. Jane that capture their character and their caliber as leaders? Well. I'll start out with the G. <laughs> he walked into the office in 1986, and I'd gotten the bright idea of going into the reinsurance business, I think in maybe 1969. So I'd stumbled along uh, for 17 years, and I had, I had a wonderful guy that, that ran it, uh, uh, but he also liked certain brokers. and I mean, it, he was running it the traditional way, the top, top quality and everything else. But, but, uh, but he fell into the, he, he didn't try and change the system. He, he tried to improve the system and, uh, to some degree. And we, just, we, went, we went nowhere. 17, 17 years wandering around in the wilderness and I thought I was, you know, I knew we could have something good. And then Ajit came in on a Saturday and uh, uh, Mike Goldberg and stirred him in, I think, and, and uh, Mike deserves to be enshrined in perpetuity for that act. And uh, I talked with him a while. I think maybe I was opening the mail on Saturday while I talked with him, and, and uh, he had absolutely zero experience with, with insurance, but he'd actually seen a good bit of how corporate America operated because he'd been in management consulting and after talking with him I, I knew I'd struck gold and, and uh, so I hired him and gave him the backing of some money uh, and we had a very good period in the market almost right away for him to act and and the jeep uh, you know if I had the top pick of 10 insurance managers in the world, I, I, I could take all 10 and they wouldn't, um, you can't replace a Jeep. And uh, we still enjoy talking. I don't, we don't talk as frequently as we used to, but we should talk about every day. Uh, but he is, he's one of a kind. And, and you know, it, if they're going to stick around long enough, you only need one of a kind. <laughs> Paul Andrews stuck around at TTI, had all the money in the world. Every time I talked to him about getting a raise or something of the sort, he said, we'll talk about that next year. It just, he was not what you get when you get the top draft picks from the leading business schools. And I will say this, I have never looked at where anybody went to school in terms of, of hiring. I mean, I, I, I just... Somebody mailed me a resume or something. I don't care where they went to school. Uh, uh, and it just so happens that, that uh, Ajit went to some pretty good schools, but he isn't Ajit because he went to the schools. And uh, Charlie, you can tell a story or two. Um, how'd you find Louis Vincenti? <laughs> well, he was there. <laughs> I, I, but you got to recognize him. I asked Louis once, how he managed to play first string football at, I think, Stanford when he only weighed 165 pounds. And he said, well, he says, I was pretty quick. And he was pretty quick. But <laughs> we, we have found a lot of people within our companies who were pretty quick. It's, it's a... Yeah, we had, we had one guy that quit at fourth grade, didn't we? And Ben Rosner, am I wrong? Oh, I'm yeah, wrong? totally self-educated. Ben Rosner knew more about retailing in difficult neighborhoods than anybody. And he watched everything in his business like a hawk. And he, he, was, he was amazing. Now there was an example. We never found anybody who could do what, when Ben died, that ability left us. Yeah. yeah, and you want a story, it's kind of interesting because Ben Rosner had a partner, Leo Simon, 
and Lee, Leo Simon was uh, Mo Annenberg's son-in-law, and Leo, therefore, was very, very, very wealthy, and uh, and then started with nothing, but they, they liked each other. And one time, well before they got involved in the, in the business, uh, of the business we bought, but they got the idea of buying a submarine from World War I and taking it to the Century of Progress, or, which was the World's Fair in effect in Chicago, I think in 1933. So they bought the submarine for not, practically nothing. And they figured, you know, the average guy from Walmart was going to his first World's Fair, <laughs> get into a submarine for a quarter or something, that they'd pay it. So they hauled it from Florida, wherever they got, they hauled it to Chicago, and then they got into Chicago, and they were hauling a submarine down the streets of Chicago, and it was creating traffic problems like nobody could imagine. So a cop came over, and he said to Ben, he says, where do you think you guys are going with that submarine? And Ben says, he says, well, I don't, he says, you'll have to talk to my partner, Mr. Capone. And the, cop, the cop says, you're on, you know, just keep going. And that was, that was Ben Rosner. And then Leo Simon died. And when he died in 1967 or so, uh, Ben Rosner kept delivering half the profits to his widow, who was incredibly rich, of course, being Mo Annenberg's first born, born daughter. I think, I think, I think Mo had nine, nine girls in a row before Walter came along, the tenth. I may be off by one, but anyway, I went to this fancy apartment, and anyway, Ben, Ben kept her in for half the deal, and he had her sign the rent checks, just so she would look like she was doing something in this business. And she didn't need the money, obviously, but he just felt he was obligated once his partner Leo died. And then she started criticizing him. And at that point, Ben went to her, his lawyer, or was her lawyer, actually, Will Felsteiner. I don't know whatever happened to Will, but he gave, me, he gave me a call because Ben wanted to call me because he wanted me to buy it. And he wanted me, if I bought it, he'd be rid of the partner's, ex-partner's wife, and, uh, and he'd get, he had me and Charlie come back and we went to Will Felsteiner's office, and Ben says, I'll work till the end of the year, and that's all. But I'll sell you this thing for six million bucks, and I had two million of cash, and a couple of million of real estate, and a couple of million of operating earnings. It was just crazy. But he felt if he was getting a lousy price, she was taking a half of the <laughs> a lousy price for half the money. So uh, uh, he looked at me at some point, Charlie, you describe the rest of it. <laughs> we'll get a kid. He, he said, I hear you're the fastest draw in the West. He says, draw. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the New York lawyer's office. And, yeah. and this guy is, he's selling, he's selling his baby. And, and he told us he was leaving. I got Charlie on the side. I said, if, if this guy leaves at the end of the year, you can throw away every psychology book that's ever been written. I mean, it isn't going to happen. He, and uh, so we bought it. And we lived happily ever after with Ben. And one time, he was taking me over to see a property we had in Brooklyn. And uh, and along the way, I said, uh, uh, Ben, I, you know, I promised you I wouldn't interfere in the business when we started. And he knew a butt was coming. And he just said, thank you, Warren. <laughs> and then <he> shut me <laughs> up. <laughs> It was a lot of fun. We, we had so many Ben Rosner stories, but now you've heard one that hasn't been published before. Okay, Becky. 